University, and he's going to tell us about something in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, I know. Yes, I'd like to uh, thank Vittorio and the other organizers for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, I am a microbiologist who tries to learn about uh, quantitative approaches that I'm trying to incorporate into my talk, but I would have never thought that as a biologist I would set foot into a center of uh, theoretical physics, but here we are. So, so first, a quick overview of what um, my lab has been up to at Oregon State for the last 10, 11 years. We are basically interested in how and why uh, bacteria, bacterial populations communicate and cooperate. We basically have two model systems. Uh, one that has dominated uh, in my lab is acyl homoserine lactone quorum sensing in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and you've already heard about that from Pete and, and others. And the second project uh, that uh, was inspired by uh, my sabbatical a couple of years ago and that I've worked on uh, more recently is iron acquisition via pyoverdin siderophores in uh, pseudomonads, okay? And I guess where my, niche, why my lab finds a niche is in sort of integrating uh, questions about the how and the why, uh, the proximate and the uh, ultimate um, answers to understanding cooperation. And in particular, we're interested in identifying mechanisms that help, st uh, help stabilize cooperation. All right. So I'm going to talk about iron acquisition uh, in pseudomonads um, today. Iron is often acquired from the environment via siderophores that are secreted under iron-limiting conditions. They're secreted into the extracellular medium where they bind iron with extremely high affinity, 10 to the minus 30 molar or so. And then they bind to a cognate receptor where they are internalized, the iron is unloaded, and then often the siderophore is recycled. These are small secreted uh, high affinity chelators and they are necessary um, in the environment because um, extracellular iron is often low and the host that is bound by, um, chelated by um, host proteins. And in aerobic environments, iron is often in its ferric uh, insoluble form. So the monads secrete pyoverdins, among other iron chelators, among other siderophores. These are small peptides, they're non ribosomally made. And it's a convenient system that is amenable to experimental um, manipulation and investigation because pyoverdin is yellow. So you can easily identify a pyoverdin producer from a non-producer by its color. And pyoverdin is also fluorescent. So you can easily quantify um, this uh, trait in uh, growing cultures. And there's a great diversity um, tremendous diversity of uh, pyoverdin in Pseudomonas species. Over 70 different structures have been identified, and that's also a, an interesting question uh, that we pursue is what drives this diversity, although that's not um, a question I will uh, deal with today. So pyoverdin is a secreted product. It is a public good that is useful for cooperation in bacterial populations because a secreted product not only benefits the focal producer, but it benefits other cells in the environment. And it's uh, commonly assumed that secretion is costly. These non-ribosomal peptides cost a lot of ATP to produce, and hence non-producers that we call cheaters should spread. Okay? One basic uh, question that we want to answer sort of uh, that um, this model system is useful for some basic physiological insight into the costs of secretion. How costly is secretion actually? Is it costly at all times? And how does the environment, and especially the nutritional environment, impact costs and hence this ability of cooperation? Why do we care about nutrition? 
Well, I guess for bacteria, almost everything is about nutrition and is about nutrient limitation because essentially every microbial growth environment is nutrient limited, be it the host, be it marine, terrestrial, aquatic environments. And as we all know, nutrient availability, nutrient limitation has a tremendous impact on gene expression, on the phenotype of the microbe. So to get a first pass at this, at this question, how costly is uh, pyoverdin production? We looked at the enzymology. This is a graphic from a, from a, a review. And it basically outlines the major players here. At the center of the pyoverdin biosynthesis uh, pathway or machinery is the non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. These are huge enzymes. They have a modular build. They have three domains, an adenylation domain, a thiolation domain, and a condensation domain. Just like on a conveyor belt, you have amino acids that are being incorporated into this uh, peptide one at a time. This is costly. Each individual uh, amino acid costs two high-energy phosphates. Then if you do the, the whole um, calculation, including precursor reactions, maturation, and exports, we estimate that about 26 high-energy phosphates per pyoverdin molecule are required to, to make it. Considering how much pyoverdin is made um, in cultures of uh, Pseudomonas, we estimate that about 15% of the total ATP that the cell needs is devoted to uh, secretion of pyoverdin. So that's, uh, at first pass, that's a huge um, metabolic burden. Yes, 15, 15, yeah. So next we did some uh, in silico um, modeling of how the nutritional environment affects these fitness costs. So we used a whole genome metabolic model that Jason Pappin's group at the University of Virginia had built several years ago. It did not contain the pyoverdin uh, reactions, so we added them to this uh, model. And then we did flux balance analysis, basically asking how an objective function, in this case growth, that's the objective I guess most bacteria have, it could grow as fast as possible, how an objective function growth rate changes with increasing pyoverdin concentration when different nutrients are limiting. So we chose carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, and sulfur. And you can see with carbon and nitrogen, there is an immediate trade-off in resource allocation between cellular biomass accumulation, i.e. growth rate, or pyoverdin production. As pyoverdin production increases, growth rate decreases. Now with these other nutrients, phosphorus, iron, and sulfur, it's like the bacterium doesn't care. It grows at the same rate until a threshold is crossed when carbon again becomes limiting, which in this case is set to the maximum, maximally op experimentally observed uptake rate. And then um, there's so much pyoverdin produced that carbon becomes limiting and then there's this trade-off, just as we, as we see with carbon limitation in the first place. Okay. So we can reconcile these observations when we consider the structure and particularly the molecular composition of pyoverdin. So fitness costs then, that is the trade-off between growth and secretion or the, the reduction in growth rate, is a function of nutrient and public good composition. So this public good, the pyoverdin, is as a peptide, as I said, uh, so it is carbon and nitrogen rich. And when carbon and nitrogen are limiting and you have this trade-off, then there's a fitness cost, but not when other nutrients are limiting, okay? So we can, yes? Rate in the biomass for uh, production of this, uh, and uh, yes. so this does not depend on the concentration of iron in the environment or? Uh, that's, that, that's right. We always said, in these cases, we always said um, one nutrient to, to be limiting based on, uh, we limit the uptake rate, and we set the other uptake rates to either be uh, open-ended, to either be just as high as can be, or to experimentally determine maximal values. Yes. So the, mm. the production of this, uh... 
Right, yes, level. yes. In, in, in this case, uh, there is no regulation built into the system. Yes, that, 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 that's a good point. Uh, we're working on a dynamic model where the regulation is actually part of the, the whole story. Yeah. Very good point. So based on these uh, fitness cost considerations, then we can make inferences about um, the evolutionary stability and cooperator cheater dynamics. Because if there is a fitness cost, then cheaters should invade a cooperating population. If there's no fitness cost, then cheaters should not invade. And so we tested this idea with a chemostat system. And it's been a couple of talks that, that uh, use the chemostat or explain the chemostat. Just go through it briefly. So it's basically a, a bioreactor, a vessel that allows you to grow bacteria at a constant uh, cell density and at a constant growth rate. Um, so they're basically at steady state. The growth rate uh, is determined by the dilution rate of the inflowing nutrient. And then there's also waste and spent, spent media and bacteria that flow out. The uh, system is well aerated, aerated and uh, well mixed. So what we use here as the growth medium is a um, synthetic minimal medium that contains chelated iron. So it requires siderophore production for growth. A mutant could not grow, a siderophore production mutant could not grow uh, in the system by itself. And we have either glucose or phosphate as either carbon or phosphorus as the growth rate limiting nutrient in the system. And we initiate about one-to-one co-cultures of a pyoverdin producer, that is the wild type, and the pyoverdin mutant that in this case is a sigma factor mutant, PVDS, that sigma factor uh, directs the biosynthesis of uh, pyoverdin. I guess I should say, um, some of you may be surprised that the sort of poor man's built, poor man's chemostat, that is in fact intentional. We tried first um, a high-tech um, stainless steel bioreactor, but we could never get iron-limited conditions, obviously. So, so this is uh, our rigged design that I actually got from, from, uh, from you, from, from Pete, you know, uh, years ago. I guess we modified it a little bit. So as I said, we had one-to-one -one, uh, competitions between a producer and a non-producer, and we uh, assessed relative fitness <clears throat> by measuring the uh, frequency of the population at the beginning and at the end of the growth period, that is after six days of, of continuous culture. And we calculated a relative fitness of the mutant versus the wild type. And the relative fitness is basically the ratio of Malthusian parameters, that is the ratio of the average growth rates. And as predicted under carbon limitation, the mutant invades. Its, its fitness is significantly higher than one. One means no invasion. Whereas under phosphorus limitation, the mutant does not invade. It does just as well as the wild type. Now, this effect is not due to simply different expression levels of uh, pyoverdin. Under carbon and under, under phosphorus limitation, uh, both uh, expression levels are indistinguishable. So to take a closer look at the dynamics under carbon-limited conditions, we indeed see that inoculum was not quite 50-50 at the beginning, but almost. So the uh, mutant, the pyoverdin uh, biosynthesis mutant, readily invades the population at the expense of the total pyoverdin level. Of course, there's fewer and fewer wild type in the system that contribute to pyoverdin production. And despite of this, despite of this invasion, there's no decrease in the total culture density. So that means that the wild type, whatever pyoverdin it produces, uh, is far more than is necessary. So pyoverdin is clearly not limiting in the system. But, yes, please. Maybe you could get to this in which case. Um, in nature, one of the advantages of the producer is to yes. so sure. facilitate the Spatial structure is also modeled in the pyoverdin system, and it clearly has a role. But we, we just were interested in the theme of being reductionist. We only wanted to model uh, nutritional effects, right. not spatial structure. The yes. Spatial structure must be key has, to has a tremendous to effect. To the yeah. Of these that is that that is true, and that's that's been done by just you know plate uh, looking at bacteria on colonies, basically where you introduce the structure. 
such that they will refuse less. Well, viscosity of the medium has been altered. That's been, that's been done too, obvious, yeah. The, the molecule could be uh, modified in a way, and there's also, it's also the idea that uh, a partial privatization of um, products that Jeff Gore has, has worked on, yeast invertase, um, results in a partial private, uh, actually large, no, 1% one, 1 of the product is, well, remains private, yeah. That's, that's the key question that I was, one of the key questions here that I was gonna get at. So there seems to be an equilibrium and we have additional data where we start with higher proportions of cheaters where we find that there's never um, extinction, that there's this apparent equilibrium. Now we don't know currently what the reason for that is, but our favorite uh, explanation is that there is an automatic switch from carbon limited to de facto iron limited because, as I said, pyoverdin levels decrease here uh, dramatically. And so through pyoverdin, you indirectly get iron limitation in the medium. And so this switch to iron limitation could mean that now there is no cost to cooperation anymore and therefore it doesn't pay uh, to cheat, right? So you basically end up with, uh, with this equilibrium. And so then in, in summary, what we've shown that um, if the building block of the public good is limiting, indicated in this case by these orange dots here, then you have this trade-off between resource allocation to either growth or secretion. Growth is slowed and cheaters can invade. If another nutrient is limiting, now the blue dots that are not part of the public good, that are not incorporated into the sidera for other uh, secretions, Growth rate is as high as it can be, as high as the cheaters, and so there's no invasion. So in principle, cooperation is uh, stable. Now what about iron limitation? After all, siderophores are produced when iron is limiting. So there are two cases that, we haven't, uh, that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, when iron is abundant, this of course is the trivial case, then you don't need siderophores, so you don't have a social uh, situation. When iron is actually growth rate limiting, then as I already alluded to, you have a, a situation where you have no cost. The iron is scavenged, and when you have no cost, then two cheaters cannot invade. And this sort of regulation scheme is akin to what's been described as metabolically prudent regulation in Pseudomonas, and uh, specifically ramnolipids. That's a biosurfactant that Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces. In a very nice paper by Zhao, uh, Javier, and uh, Kevin Foster. And these, these ramnolipids, too, are only made when nitrogen, but not carbon, is limiting. Okay, ramnolipids are carbon rich, so they're only made when it doesn't cost anything. So, then in conclusion, what we've shown is that the costs of cooperation are highly context dependent, and particularly the chemical composition and, of the public good and the um, nutrient source determine the evolutionary stability of cooperation. And this provides, we think, a nice framework to consider the presence of secretion negative isolates in infections. Why are they there? And can we make predictions of when they should arise in certain environments that are nutrient limited one way or another? So now I'd like to come back to the situation that um, Jeff alluded to, namely the fact that we never saw a population con uh, a collapse or uh, a tragedy of the commons in this chemostat, which would be, which would manifest in just washout of the population, okay, from uh, cheaters emerging. And we certainly uh, think we have a reasonable explanation. It's a switch in nutrient limitation, although there are other uh, potential explanations for why there's a stable equilibrium. In this case, nevertheless, conventional wisdom tells us, or what we are told in various you know, publications, cheaters exploit cooperators to the point of population collapse. Tra the tragedy of the common should be widespread, but actually when you look in the literature, it isn't. So a tragedy of the commons is not very common in the microbial uh, systems that have been investigated. Of course, the first case um, that, that demonstrated cheating in, in uh, Greg Vallis's group was in uh, fruiting bodies of Myxococcus santus, uh, analogous to what we've heard about Dicti uh, yesterday. So you have these fruiting bodies that consist of um, 
a sporangium and a stalk. And these cheaters, when they emerge, they preferentially form spores. They don't like to be altruistic uh, stalk cells. And so they enrich uh, in the sporangium until the whole system collapses because there isn't enough cells left to build the, build the uh, stalk. Now, a similar situation in uh, Pseudomonas fluorescens where you have pellicles that form at the um, air-liquid interface, as you see here. And um, Paul Rainey's lab now at New Zealand uh, has uh, worked on this and shown that cheating, too, can lead to extinction, can lead to collapse of this pellicle, because pellicle formation requires the production of an exopolysaccharide, but cheaters that don't produce this exopolysaccharide put so much weight on the pellicle that it eventually sinks to the bottom of the ocean floor or the, actually the test tube. Okay. So in search of you know, evidence uh, in the literature, does a tragedy of the commons, population collapse ha happened in a chemostat, you couldn't find any. There, there was nothing. Maybe some of you guys know. And in general, we, we couldn't find any mathematical proof that a tragedy of the commons really happens. Now, there is game theoretical uh, literature that suggests that cheaters should always win, but typically that doesn't feed back on the population productivity. Am I correct? All right. <laughs> okay. So again, this is sort of new territory, and I've collaborated with uh, a mathematician at Oregon State and two other mathematicians at uh, Arizona State to actually prove the tragedy of the commons that in principle it should occur in the chemostat when the public good is always costly, it is fully shared, is not partially privatized, and there is a well-mixed environment. Okay. So we have a cooperator, and we have a cheater here. And in this case, they actually use an enzyme, not a siderophore. They, they uh, secrete an enzyme as the public good that converts a substrate into a product, and then that product is the growth rate limiting nutrient at the same time. Both are taken, or uh, cooperators and cheaters take up this uh, product at the same rate. The cheater incorporates it all into biomass, but then in the, in the cooperator, there's this trade off between either growth or secretion. Okay. Now, when we start with the cooperator only, so only this guy in the chemostat, not this one, we have an initial phase of growth. The red guy is the, is the cooperator from a low inoculum. And so you have a concomitant um, increase in enzyme production, in product formation, and the depletion of substrate, of course. But slowly thereafter, you have an equilibrium forming. And this equilibrium, of course, depends on initial conditions and uh, parameter values. But now when we introduce the, the cheater here, we have the following situation. We have the cheater at, at very low frequency. It enriches at the expense of the cooperator, but only to a certain degree. At some point, there is not enough cooperator in the system to, to, to sustain the cheater, and the both go extinct. And actually, this is very robust. This always happens, uh, no matter what the initial conditions or what the parameter values are, whether you have a siderophore, an enzyme, and, and whatnot. So the only thing is that uh, the the cooperator pays a cost that the cheater does not. Okay. So this seems biologically intuitive, certainly to, to many of us, but it was apparently not mathematically trivial, as uh, Patrick uh, tells me. And even though it, is, it, it may be biologically intuitive, we did a little, actually a little poll, um, non-representative poll with, with colleagues, some of them were mathematicians and some were engineers, to ask them, so what do you think should be the outcome of the system? Would you always expect a population collapse? And not a single one said, yes, that's what you would expect. Okay. So anyhow, the, the, the next uh, step is a little bit of a deviation from the within species cheating. Now we go to between, uh, between species. This is an interaction that uh, you may call cheating, but it's commonly called cross-feeding in the literature, so following on the theme that <clears throat> we've heard this morning, excuse me. So this is the bacterium that we've, uh, that I've already introduced to you, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that produces a siderophore that it can bind, it's, it can utilize itself, but of course there are other bacteria, other species, like this Pseudomonas protogens, that cross-feeds because it produces a matching receptor. Oftentimes, these cross-feeders also produce their own siderophore. And now the question that we wanted to ask here, how is pyoverdin production and reception regulated when 
this species is presented with the opportunity to crossfeed. Would it then forego producing its own siderophore because it has the opportunity to cheat, basically? And how does this um, regulation affect uh, relative fitness? Okay. So we chose a, a model system here, um, the consummate crossfeeder, I would say, Pseudomonas protogens, that a colleague at Oregon State, uh, Joyce Loper, has worked on and has done beautiful experimental work to identify the fairy pyoburden uh, receptors. So there's five heterologous receptors out of 45 ton B dependent outer membrane proteins. So all these outer membrane proteins could potentially bind siderophores and crossfeed. They may bind other small molecules as ton B dependent uh, uh, proteins have, have uh, demonstrated to do. But we have these five heterologous fairy pyoburden receptors. One, two, three, four, five, and the matching bacterial siderophore and the producing species have also been identified. And of course, the six siderophore here is the one that uh, binds the homologous or the self-produced um, siderophore. So with this system, we first asked, is the receptor upregulated only when presented with the matching siderophore? We did this by real-time PCR, we looked at the suite of uh, six receptors, and we added the corresponding uh, siderophore. There's always the receptor and the siderophore in a matching uh, color. And as you can clearly see, in most cases, yes, the receptor is only expressed when the siderophore is present in the supernatant. And I should add, we, uh, we have not used purified uh, pyoverdin here. We've used supernatant, but in previous studies, it's been shown that they're functionally uh, equivalent. So even when you add two siderophores, two matching receptors are expressed, okay? There are some exceptions. In this case, BN7, um, even though we know that the brown receptor is required for the use of this brown siderophore, it is not induced. We surmise, therefore, that uh, expression is already constitutive. And in the case of um, B10 here, the green receptor is indeed induced in the uh, presence of its matching siderophore, but so are many others. And this is probably a case of structural promiscuity where uh, receptors can bind um, multiple siderophores. In other words, this receptor, uh, this uh, siderophore can bind to multiple receptors. So next, we turned our attention to the expression of the endogenous uh, pyoverdin produced by um, PF5. So does PF5 still produce its siderophore, its, uh, its pyoverdin, when presented with the opportunity to crossfeed? So we looked at three different strains here, the wild type, and the two functionally equivalent uh, pyoverdin mutants, okay? We looked at growth in culture, and we looked at uh, fluorescence, um, fluorescence um, uh, excitation, basically as a measurement of pyoverdin production. And so in the absence or in the presence of these various um, uh, pyoverdins from the different uh, species. So when there is no pyoverdin provided, then you find that only the wild type can grow. The two mutants don't. And you find that, of course, the producing strain produces a siderophore because it is required in this uh, growth medium. When you add the respective uh, siderophores, you find that all strains can grow at the wild type level. So the mutants are restored to growth to the wild type level. So the amount of siderophore that we've added is fully sufficient. And nevertheless, as the fluorescent spectra show, they still make their own siderophore. So basically here, uh, in, uh, shaded in gray, is the contribution of the fluorescence from the siderophore that's added. That doesn't change over time. It's always constant. But then above that, you see the contribution of the endogenously produced siderophore. So even when given the opportunity to crossfeed, this uh, uh, strain still produces its own siderophore. So to uh, look into this, to sort of identify the, the, the reason why they might be doing this, we 
used uh, a co-culture system of Pseudomonas prodigens with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces a pyoverdin that um, it itself can use, but that uh, Pseudomonas prodigens PF5 can also use, but then in turn, Protogens um, only produces a sidero-4 that it itself can use. And there's no cross-feeding. So there is, in this model, you have a unidirectional cross-feeding. And we verified that this is indeed the case with uh, synthesis mutants. So the PIO1, pyoverdin synthesis mutant, um, requires its own sidero-4, whereas PF5 can grow on its own CDR4 or that provided by PA1. The two, the red and the green, are virtually uh, overlapping here. So then we, we did uh, co culturing uh, experiments to determine the fitness of PF5 relative to PA1. Again, 50 50 uh, co culturing experiments. And you find when you put the two together, uh, without any additional pyoverdin or supernatant, just endogenously produced by both species, you find that the PF5 does a little bit better than PA1. When you take away the ability to produce uh, pyoverdin by PA1, then its relative fitness drops greatly. It can be chemically complemented by adding uh, more than that, by adding uh, uh, supernatant. Now, to further um, elucidate what's going on, we looked at how uh, pyoverdin amendment affects the growth rate of PAO1. And to PAO1 pure cultures, we either added um, no supernatant or supernatant containing pyoverdin from PF5 or supernatant uh, devoid of the PF5 uh, pyoverdin. And we find that indeed. Um, PF5 greatly reduces the growth rate of uh, PA1 in the presence or uh, through probably sequestration of uh, iron. So in conclusion then, we can say that uh, heterologous pyoverdins induce expression of the cognate receptors, made to order, so to speak, and self-produced pyoverdin is expressed during cross-feeding and provides a competitive um, advantage. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people that did the work. So what I've presented today was on Sidero 4 cooperation. So there's a, a, a graduate student who's just uh, graduated, Joe Sexton, together with an undergrad, Amandip Singh. And also the people that I've collaborated with during my uh, sabbatical, Katja Bettenbrock and Stefan Klumpt at the Max Planck Institute Magdeburg. They helped um, basically get the metabolic model rolling and helped a little bit with chemostat uh, uh, stuff. And uh, Radha Krishnan Mahadevan from the University of Toronto is also a metabolic modeler who helped with this. And uh, Joyce Loper uh, helped with uh, expertise on uh, PF5 and provided reagents. We also have another project in the lab that revolves around quorum sensing. And there um, I have a a student that also just graduated, Kyle Asphal, and a new graduate student, uh, Tana Robinson. And uh, I thank funding agencies and thank you for your attention. <laughs>